So hi, welcome to the first meeting in the first Essex Radical Conference. Um, we apologize for, for, the, for the room. We will try that the next rooms we will be using are bigger and you will have to sit in, in the tables. Um, our first meeting is, is on activism uh, and our first speaker is, is Mark Bergfeld, who was a leading member of, of, of the, the student demonstrations in 2011 and he has been uh, writing articles and, and being an activist basically since then. Uh, he's going to speak for 20 minutes. Yeah, okay. Look, I, you know, just for you, I prepared my first PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> you know, so I don't know how to actually get it started. <laughs> like, yeah, this one? Yes. Yeah, okay, good, good. Okay, so I used to study here at Essex. Now I study at Queen Mary's in the business school, believe it or not. Um, you know, it actually taught me much more uh, than I learned here in the, uh, in the government department, believe it or not. But yeah, so that's basically uh, my background. Now the thing is, I think it's really interesting to talk about the kind of movements that we have seen, and kind of uh, the movements we have seen from Spain to uh, to Occupy Wall Street, the British UK student movement, the Arab Spring, Occupy Wisconsin, <coughs> and what they're not called. Because first and foremost, they they were labeled as a new phenomena, uh, and they actually started to come to terms with the kind of financial capitalism that, and the crisis that broke out. Uh, in, in 2008, after people believed that we wouldn't see any response to uh, the financial uh, crisis uh, what, whatsoever. And there has been a lot of discussions, and particularly it's important for us to look kind of back to what the last two years <coughs> have, have actually taught us about the way that social movements and the way that mass movements are portrayed in the media and in popular literature but as well as what we can learn through the movements. So what I'm going to attempt is, is to take some of the most like, famous and prominent writings of the movements over the last two years and try to kind of give sense to what they're trying to do and how we can start to theorize through the movements that we have seen into where do we want to go to, what are the next steps for Occupy Wall Street, what are the next steps for the global movement against austerity and capitalism. And there's like five common assumptions about the movements that have been made over the last uh, a couple of years. The first is that they're horizontal, that they're decentralized, that they're leaderless, demandless, and that they're, and that they're networked. And if, for anyone who wants to do some more reading around it, I've put uh, some slides up. And what I effectively argue is that there are some elements in the writings that you can see, which are, of course, describe the situation and describe the movements very well. However, what we're faced with is a strategic impasse where the movements can no longer develop in the same way as, as they have done before because of, the, because of the limits that they have reached due to some of the organizational, uh, due to some of the organizational questions which, uh, the movement, uh, which the movements themselves have, have raised. So if you look at horizontalism, horizontalism is a concept that was born out of the 2001 Argentinian debt default and when the IMF intervened in, in, in Argentina in 2001 and the Piqueteros movement, which was a movement of unemployed workers which would block uh, highways and streets and suddenly as Ma Marina Zitrin and Dario Azzellini, who were two participants in the movements there, uh, described, suddenly people were speaking about horizontal horizontalidad, I don't speak any Spanish, but for, it's just the translation of horizontalism. And it doesn't only mean that horizontalism is a way of operating through consensus decision making, as, we're, as we know it through Occupy Wall Street, student occupations and whatnot, but it also, is a, it also is both a tool as well as a goal that the kind of society that people want to establish through the movements like Occupy Wall Street, like the Indignados, is going to be a horizontal one rather than a vertical one, which is based, uh, based, on, hi uh, based on hierarchies. And that raises a, a really important question for us, because if people are starting to adopt different forms, organizational forms, than the ones which currently uh, rule over us, so instead of using representative democracy and, re and using uh, horizontal forms of democracy, Effectively, it, counter, it, it shows in to what extent the movements have adopted an anti-systemic critique of the system. Through. There's a problem with that, because if you say, well, if, 
people start using one form of democratic practice rather than the established one of parliamentary procedures, democracy, and whatnot, doesn't it simply value form over content? And what I mean by that is the question of whether the politics, the kind of form, the kind of demands, the kind of uh, articulation, the slogans, etc., are lost in procedure, in procedural, uh, in procedure, in new procedures, which first have to be established within inside the movement. And so many people might argue that actually saying that horizontalism kind of embodies the spirit of these of these new movements is quite unideological and can't compete with the dominant ideologies, with the dominant narratives that have been put forward in the, in our phase of capitalism. So horizontalism isn't an adequate tool to combat the kind of drive to drive to austerity. What it however has opened <coughs> is an inclusive process. And that inclusive process of starting to uh, being able to communicate amongst one another Across different, uh, across different ideologies, whether you consider yourself a revolutionary socialist like myself, or whether you consider yourself an anarchist, whether you consider yourself a social democrat, or the kind of multiplicity of ideologies that per persist within it, can come together in that kind of conversation which started in 2001 and continues until, until today. And now, it would be easy for me to just take a bunch of critics of horizontalism, and say, well, I told you all along, horizontalism is not adequate to what, uh, what the movement and what we need in order to lose, uh, in order to win against the austerity measures which we confront. But effectively, I will show some limitations all throughout the presentation by the people who themselves have celebrated over the last 10 years since the anti-capitalist movement who have celebrated those forms of actions, such as Naomi Klein, <coughs> Who, who wrote her very famous book, No Logo, and afterwards The Shock Doctrine, who has been, uh, who, played a, uh, who played a magnificent role in the climate protest, COP, uh, COP15 protest in Copenhagen in 2009. She's a foremost, uh, foremost proponent of horizontalism, and even she said, well, when Occupy, came, uh, when Occupy happened, she said that it will not be able to weather the, uh, the, the storms ahead. Zitrin and Azzelini, themselves use probably the most critical realist, uh, uh, critical realist um, <coughs> criticism of horizontalism that it cannot exist in a sea, uh, in, a, in a sea of capitalism on itself. So how can, uh, so how can the picateros in it uh, themselves, or whether it's the student occupation in a sea of capitalism, establish a horizontal society or a horizontal forms of communication and? of action when the whole world around them effectively is not organized uh, in, in that way. And according to Tadjo Miller, who is a very <coughs> famous uh, movement, uh, movement activist, uh, in particularly in the autonomous scene in Germany, said that actually what happened is, is that horizontalism was adequate in 2001 when there weren't any uh, radical left parties such as Syriza, uh, Bloco Esquerda in Portugal, the, you know, we were talking about the CUP in Spain before Die Linke in Germany, and when there weren't NGOs which aligned themselves with the struggle. Nowadays, what you effectively would need is a form of diagonalism, where no, move, grassroots movement activists wouldn't only work together, um, wouldn't only remain in their activist ghettos, but effectively reach out to organizations, to political parties, to trade unions, which are not organized along the same uh, same pr uh, principle, and I think that opens up uh, that opens up some really important considerations in terms of how we organize inside of social uh, inside of social movements today. Because whenever social movements come about, it isn't simply that they come about without any pre-existing organizations, without any pre-existing links or coalitions that exist, whether they're formal or informal. Effectively, you always have groups of people who have previously organized amongst, uh, amongst themselves and who will carry those experiences into the next round of struggle. <coughs> there is, because of the way that capitalism fractures, uh, fractures our consciousness in the way it creates uh, divisions between people, it also creates un uh, inequities, <coughs> inequities be between, between people, between organizations, and that needs to be accounted if we are to move uh, to the next 
uh, to the next phase. The second proposition that comes out of the movement is that these movements are decentralized. And there's two events, really, that sum up in terms of why this, uh, why this phase that we are currently experiencing or for the last 10 years is called the movement of movements. On the 15th of February 2003, we saw 15.9 million people march against the invasion uh, of Iraq across 600, 600, 600 cities. That call was issued at the European Social Forum in Florence, which brought together movement activists from across, from across the globe. And it was through the process of having an organizing body, organizing the European and World Social Forums, that that kind of decentralized action was able to happen. However, there has been a shift in the way that global protests are now being, uh, being called, in the fact that the call for the 15th of October 2011, which had uh, protests or even square occupations in more than 900 towns and cities across the, on all five continents, supposedly, um, effectively um, effectively was called by the Spanish indignados themselves and then was <coughs> taken up by a number of activists in their, res in their respective countries. And so for the first time we see how a group located and rooted in one area was able to, uh, was able to call a decent decentralized protest. Now, the reason why people also, in, in, and in particularly, uh, particular Paul Mason speaks about decentralization of protest is because what we have seen over a very short period of time between October, November 2010 with the beginning of the student movement in the UK and then up until the end of 2011, what we saw was Occupy, uh, we saw the UK student movement, Arab Spring, Indignado protest, Occupy Wall Street, then the Chilean winter, and then the Quebec student strike, all in one, all in one sequence and all decentralized, and all of those movements actually referred to the movement which had preceded it. So the UK student movement was effectively said, we align ourselves with the French school students, with all those, uh, with, and we draw inspiration from the French school students. In Egypt, they were saying, oh, we saw people marching through, through Milbank Tower in London. In Wisconsin, <coughs> they were holding up signs, greeting, uh, greeting to Tahir from Wisconsin. Occupy Wall Street was referring time and time again to the Occupy Wisconsin as the beginning of the American Occupy movement. The Indignados, of course, drawing on all of these different, different struggles. And that's why people are talking about decentralization. Here's a quick map of where protests were on the 15th of October 2011. And you literally even have protests in the Seychelles, if I'm, if, if I'm not wrong about that, and an occupation there. And if you look on Wikipedia, which I did in preparation for this, of, where, of how many protesters there were, it probably amounts to similar numbers that we saw, uh, that we saw actually on the 15th of February 2003. And on the 15th of February 2003, we can't forget that it was formal organizations which called the protest. So attack in France and Germany and other places really was part of mobilizing for it. Here it was informal groups for the first time mobilizing and formal groups coming in, uh, in behind the demonstration. So there's three things I really want to draw, draw out of this. This is perfect. Draw out of this. It's what I call the uneven and combined development, a term uh, stolen from, uh, from Trotsky in a very different context. Uh, of protest movements. And what I mean by that is, is that because of the way that capitalism and uh, global capitalism <coughs> is inflicting austerity not only in the UK but ac across, across the entire global north and has been doing so across the global south for more than, for more for, than 30 years now, what we see is that the protest movements are uneven across, <laughs> across various national uh, and, ge and uh, geographic uh, geographic dimensions, but because people in Greece are experiencing the same as their experience, uh, if we are to move uh, to the next uh, to the next phase, the second proposition that comes out of the movement is that these movements are decentralized, and there's two events really that sum up in terms of why this uh, why this phase that we are currently experiencing or for the last 10 years is called the movement of movements. 
On the 15th of February 2003, we saw 15.9 million people march against the invasion uh, of Iraq across 600, 600, 600 cities. That call was issued at the European Social Forum in Florence, which brought together movement activists from across, from across the globe. And it was through the process of having an organizing body, organizing the European and World Social Forums, that that kind of decentralized action was able to happen. However, there has been a shift in the way that global protests are now being, uh, being called, in the fact that the call for the 15th of October 2011, which had uh, protests or even square occupations in more than 900 towns and cities across, across on all five continents, supposedly, <coughs> Um, effectively, um, effectively was called by the Spanish indignados themselves, and then was <coughs> taken up by a number of activists in their res in their respective countries. And so, for the first time, we see how a group located and rooted in one area was able to uh, was able to call a decent decentralized protest. Now. The reason why people also, in, in, and in particularly, uh, particular Paul Mason speaks about decentralization of protest is because what we have seen over a very short period of time between October, November 2010 with the beginning of the student movement in the UK and then up until the end of 2011, what we saw was Occupy, uh, we saw the UK student movement, Arab Spring, Indignado protest, Occupy Wall Street, then the Chilean winter, and then the Quebec student strike, all in one, all in one sequence, and all decentralized, and all of those movements actually referred to the movement which had preceded it. So the UK student movement was effectively said, we align ourselves with the French school students, with all those, uh, with, and we draw inspiration from the French school students. In Egypt, they were saying, oh, we saw people marching through, through Millbank Tower in London. In Wisconsin, <coughs> they were holding up signs, greeting, uh, greeting to Tahrir from Wisconsin. Occupy Wall Street was referring time and time again to the Occupy Wisconsin as the beginning of the American Occupy movement. The Indignados, of course, drawing on all of these different, different struggles. And that's why people are talking about decentralization. Here's a quick map of where protests were on the 15th of October 2011, and you literally even have protests in the Seychelles, if I'm, if, if I'm not wrong about that, and an occupation there. And if you look on Wikipedia, which I did in preparation for this, of, where, of how many protesters there were, it probably amounts to similar numbers that we saw, uh, that we saw actually on the 15th of February 2003. And on the 15th of February 2003, we can't forget that it was formal organizations which called the protest. So attack in France and Germany and other places really was part of mobilizing for it. Here it was informal groups for the first time mobilizing and formal groups coming in, uh, in behind the demonstration. So there's three things I really want to draw, draw out of this. This is perfect. Draw out of this. It's what I call the uneven and combined development a term uh, stolen from, uh, from Trotsky in a very different context uh, of protest movements. And what I mean by that is, is that because of the way that capitalism and uh, global capitalism <coughs> is inflicting austerity not only in the UK but ac across, across the entire global north and has been doing so across the global south for more than, for more for than 30 years now, what we see is that the protest movements are uneven across across various national uh, and ge and uh, geographic uh, geographic dimensions. But because people in Greece are experiencing the same as their experience, uh, they try to create the sense of centralization insofar that they try to assemble in town squares and and cities in their in their particular localities in order to combat the kind of fragmentation that they uh, that people experience in their in their everyday life but also experience in the various social movements and organizations that they have been part of over the last 10 year over the last uh, over the last 10 years and the crucial third element of that is is that if you look back at history and you look at the part uh, early part of the 20th century and a lot of military uh, military writings from the Communist International, 
what you see is, is that they say, if you start a riot, and this is like an instruction manual, you have to start it in the popular neighborhoods of, uh, and in the, and in the, and kind of what it could be considered the suburbs and outside of the city center, where people know the geography much better, where people are home, because you will immediately be able to win people over to your side to fight on the barricades with you. Whereas this time round, it's actually because of the popular visibility. It's actually, and because of the the way that cities have have been structured over the last. Uh, over the last century, that actually people are assembling in the town, in the towns and city, and city centers, and then are moving outwards in the second phase of their mo of the movement, such as we have seen with Occupy the Hood, where people are uh, fighting against foreclosures in various ca uh, various boroughs of New York, or whether we look at the Occupy Gazi protest, where during the summer, once the movement had been dispersed from the towns and city centers in Turkey, then went out into the popular neighborhoods and started building uh, neighborhood, neighborhood assemblies. And as far as I'm aware of, a similar movement actually came out of the Spanish indignados, uh, indignados as well. Uh, leaderless. I think this is one of the things that you can have whenever you go to a protest these days or whenever you're part of even discussing politics, you always start, this, you always start talking about Oh, how great is leaderlessness and how you, uh, <coughs> movements are leaderless these days. And just two quotes from The Economist a few days after Occupy started. Leaderless, consensus-based, participatory democracy and its discontent was the front page story of The Economist. And The Washington <coughs> Post ran an article on its front page also a few days after, okay, well, a month uh, after actually Occupy Wall Street had started. What is Occupy Wall Street? The history of leaderless movement. And you can, if you punch that into Google, you'll find the article. And it literally goes through all, supposedly, all the leaderless movements which have existed, including the civil rights movement, totally dis not acknowledging whatsoever that you know there have been some leaders like Martin Luther King or you know Malcolm X or perhaps Rosa Parks. You know, but well, anyway, there are. And what Laurie Penny writes about the UK student movement is, is he writes. There are no leaders here. This is a leaderless protest with no agenda but justice. And that kind of sums up the zeitgeist, not, no relation to the movie, <laughs> no, but it sums up the zeitgeist uh, of what's, you know, current protest and how there is a fetishism of leaderlessness inside, inside of the movement. And David Graeber, who was a participant and who is a very a prominent uh, social movement activists and anarchists write, the first decision ensured that there would be no formal <coughs> leadership structure that we could be co-opted or co coerced. He writes about Occupy, uh, Occupy Wall, uh, Wall Street. And I think it's important to see that his uh, emphasis lies on the, that there would be no formal, because there can be informal leaderships and there can be formal leaderships. I will return to that in a minute. And part of this is founded on the theoretical notions and uh, research that has been done by a Catalonian social movements researcher and uh, network theorist called <coughs> Manuel Castells. And he, since the 1980s already, he's, he's been saying that in capitalism, uh, the way that corporations op operate, the way that power functions inside, inside of capitalism, is, is horizontal, and social movements have responded uh, to that in the way of structuring themselves uh, in a networked, in a networked faction, uh, fashion, and in a leaderless, and in a leaderless fashion, uh, <coughs> and in a leaderless fashion, uh, fashion, uh, as well. No leaders. How many? Min minutes. Five minutes. So, and effectively, I found some concepts which I think can inform us really what. Uh, what is meant by that? Not because I think that they're ex that they're correct, but I think they also indicate a valuable shift to think about strategy and tactics from some of the activists who have been most involved in building those in building those movements. And so Dana Williams, who was an activist and one of the organizers of Occupy Rights, there are no leaders, or more radically, everyone is a leader. And what is she effectively is saying is summed up by the Occupy Research Collective is the movement isn't leaderless, it isn't the vanguardist movement, but it is leaderful. 
that it is full of leaders, everyone taking taking ini initiative and initiative, and that brings me on to the two uh, uh, two sets of problems. The first one is is our concept of leadership, given that we live in a capitalist society where we see you know gray-haired white men taking decisions over our lives all the time, that we see leadership in, uh, invested into individuals, do not often conceive of leadership as a collective process in which actually leadership is distributed amongst a number of people by people taking different initiatives communicating uh, uh, communicating amongst one another so if I have a conversation with you today I actually will take something back and will try to uh, take, take that on to the next person uh, the other thing is is that effectively the distinction between formal and informal leadership that effectively we are used to having parliamentarians being elected by representative means. However, there's also informal leadership. So who, no one remembers the name of the woman who kicked off the Russian Revolution when she was standing in the bread queue. And that's a, she wasn't elected by anyone, but she displayed a form, a form of <coughs> informal leadership. Similarly, you have, people, uh, you have people taking different initiatives at different times and assuming a function which exists in, in society as a whole. And some of the writings I kind of draw uh, upon there are by a thing called the uh, dialogical, uh, the dialo dialogist school, which is, uh, which is kind of, yeah, which is Vygotsky, Paulo Freire, who was like a, a radical pedagogist in Latin America, and Bakhtin, who was a, uh, uh, Bakhtin and people like that, and I think those kinds of writings can in try to inform us about how commu how communication creates leadership, and how and how uh, leadership. Yeah, I'll need to, uh, I'll skip the network because we can talk about social uh, social media, uh, and everyone has you know their own thing uh, to say. I'll talk about demands because I think that demands are are some of the most uh, most Im important aspects of the movement because what we saw was is that we really witnessed how Occupy didn't come up with that unitary demand. We didn't see how this UK student movement, of course, had you know a number of different demands, but it wasn't called the free education movement, for example. And what I draw up is, and I think you know, if people really disagree with this, then they, then they should, you know, and we can have a debate about it. But I say there are essentially four phases of demand which correspond to the way that the system and capitalism was organized and its potentials to realize market value. In other words, is when there was capacities for the system to continue to develop, to produce growth, and give some of the crumbs to working people, the nature of demands that social movements adopted was very different than in periods of intense social and economic crisis as it is today. And what I say is, is that there's the action enacted the demand which effectively is the phase where we have work, mass working class movements which are, allowed, which are able to wrest power away from the ruling classes through the eight hour day, the end to child labor, uh, what, else do I ha what else do I have? It's for example the women's right to vote, I would categorize in that as well. That those were brought about by mass movement and even though there was opposition in parliament and no socialist majority in those parliaments or no social democratic majority in those parliaments, those demands could be enacted because there was that free space inside of society at that moment in order, in, in order to bring those about. The corporatist demand is effectively the demand of the incorporation of, of, the work, of the working classes into the welfare state in which a socialist, socialist social democratic majorities are able to d deliver demands on behalf, on, behalf of, on behalf of the people. And then there's a rupture in 1960, and then there's a rupture in could be achieved, but it also starts to transcend some of the narrow confines of, so, of the way that social democratic demands, uh, demands operate. And then the last phase is what I call the era of demandlessness, which effectively sets in with the state of, with 1973 and the state of permanent austerity that we have witnessed, in which actually with the workers' movements, uh, social movements have demanded a number of a no number of different things, and always con and continuously have been ignored. Whether it's the shutting down of nuclear power stations and the anti-nuclear movement, 
whether it is the stop the war movement going to the streets and uh, demanding that uh, Iraq not be invaded and, and are, are, ign are ignored. And effectively, what we are delivered in Parliament are, are supposedly reforms, but effectively they just exacerbate the class divisions inside society. And this culminates in this kind of demandless nature of social movements, because social movements <coughs> can no longer articulate what, what they want to actually achieve, because first of all, there are so many problems, Second of all, because it seems it seems utopian to believe that even that the ruling classes or parliament would even concede to any of such demands. And I think this actually sums it up. This is from the Onion, right? The satire page. But effectively, they say nation waiting for protesters to clearly articulate demands before ignoring them. And I think that this really sums up the kind of period we live in. We've taken. If whether you occupy <coughs> over uh, student over tuition fees, you articulate five demands, none of them is met. So in the end, it's no surprise then that students want to occupy their buildings or occupy their lectures, at, uh, lecture halls, and then say, why do we even need demands? In the end, they'll be ignored anyway. It poses a problem, but it also poses an opportunity for us to transcend the kind of limitations of social democratic demands. Uh, democratic demands. Occupy everything, demand nothing was a very famous <coughs> slogan inside of the Occupy movement. It came out of the student movement in 2009 in California and New School in America. And I've kind of drawn up and I'll upload this onto you know, and uh, upload this onto the internet later on, so you guys can and uh, you get, you can check it you can check it out. But I've effectively summed this up. So we're at a strategic impasse. As these people are saying, we're not disorganized, America just has too many issues. And it's kind of that this sums up where we're currently at. We've had brilliant mass movements over the last two, two years. However, we haven't, in some ways, we haven't succeeded in bringing about change. And that's something that we need to, that we need to acknowledge, but it's also something that we can, uh, that we can, o uh, we can overcome. So how do we move from A to B? It's the crucial question. How do we move from the p point where we are, have started to act collectively in social movements, in mass movements, in general strikes, and suddenly have kind of an, a notion that people power is impossible? Even in the belly of the beast, it would have never been imaginable before 2011 that Americans, some of the most apathetic people that are probably out there, would go and occupy squares against financial, against financial cap uh, capitalism. And one of the things is, is that we need to come to terms with what is power, where is power vested inside of movements, and Paul Mason, for example, says that there's the power of mayhem, which is literally the power to go out and riot, well, that's one thing, or how do we formulate power differently as Occupy Oakland did, in terms of linking up the square occupation with the general strike and shutting down uh, shutting down what, the fifth largest port in in the United States and looking to uh, and and doing that. And so I think we need to theorize through the movement, and those are open questions. I think we need to answer what, we, what do we understand as spontaneity, and how do we come to terms with spontaneity? Rosa Luxemburg wrote in the mass strike wrote about spontaneity, but we need to revisit those questions because unless we revisit those questions, I don't think everyone will kind of, you know, will kind of understand horizontalism, leader, leadership in the way that we can actually come to terms with some of, uh, some of those notions and actually build the kind of movements that can, uh, and be part of those kind of movements that can challenge uh, capitalism. I think we also need to think about a strategic transformation and by that is, is the old divide has always been around reform and revolution and I exist but because of the space that has opened up and reformist parties, social democracy being in terminal decline, I do actually think we need to think about how do we actually go to a place where we could have, for example, a European, to European wide Tobin tax. That's nothing revolutionary, but at the same time it seems quite utopian that anything of that kind would be implemented at this, kind of, at this moment. Lastly, the question of popular agency, where does uh, links into the question of power that I mentioned before. 
and that means that I might believe that the working class can, you know, lead lead a revolution, and I think it will have to, it will play a central part in any kind of strategic transformation or revolution. However, that is not commonly accepted inside of the movements that are, are are operating today and that have happened today. And so the question is, is where does popular agency lie in those movements that we have currently seen? And I think Dan will speak to speak about that later. And then lastly, of course we need to have an analysis of capitalism. I can't forget, you know, who actually has beset the evil upon us. Okay, so thank you, Mark. Our next speaker is Zemi Gilligan from... Hi, I'm in this way. It's um, kind of like a choreographed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, he's a GTA teacher here at the University of Essex in the philosophy department. Uh, he has been uh, an activist in this university for, for so many years. And <laughs> too many, I would say. And um, he's going to speak on activism for 20 minutes. Five years, it's not that many. Um, just someone open the